welcome to this very special care collab video together with Todd's Tropicals, Suli Charon, and TD More Than Just Orchids. And we have teamed up to show our different methods of care in our different climates for this and great crestwood. Mine is tomorrow star, but I'll just keep saying Crestwood because it was a Mr. Crestwood in 1973 who made this cross. I was only seven at the time. Who knew that having seen these in nature in Kenya, we had a lot of people that just grew them in their gardens. Who knew that one day I would be in Southern Spain growing one in a pot. I didn't. Not only growing one, but actually getting one to flower. Back in the day, I was always raised up on the shoulders of someone in order to admire the blooms because these can grow very, very large. Having said that, mine is not yet in bloom and we are at the beginning of February. Before I go into all the care and what I do to make mine survive here with a humidity factor of more often than not less than 30%, this cross has got quite the history. So how this all came about to get to this Angraecum Crestwood cross, it started with a sesquipedale that was crossed with an Eburnium. And that cross created the Vecciae. Then he took the Vecciae cross and crossed it back with a sesquipedale again. And this is what you see here, which is the Crestwood. The result of all this crisscrossing has produced a stouter orchid not as large as the original sesquipedale would be, but the blooms have taken on the attributes of the sesquipedale with just a few little differences in the fact that they won't be as large and the color of the blooms will lean a little bit more towards the vecchiae, which will, I hope, have a white lip, white ivory kinds of petals and the sepals being a little bit more on the green side, the lip should have a, like a greenish throat with a white line down through it. So all these things I have as yet to determine to make sure that I have a crestwood, but I will go with what I have on the label for the time being. And the blooms should last up to four weeks, which is wonderful because I am looking forward to the fragrance at night. I, they should be nocturnally fragrant and not everybody is a big fan of this fragrance but I can't tell you yet I wouldn't know. I can't also tell you how far away my blooms are from opening. I do expect the spur to actually grow a little bit longer and these still look really really tight and very very green to me more like okra but they, they're fantastic. I love the missile effect. And I'm also very, very relieved that I, was, I bought this orchid three years ago and was told it would bloom in five years. So I'm two years ahead of schedule. And it's been a little bit of a nerve wracking time for me because you can see by spider webs, I am hardly moving this orchid. I'm so nervous about these buds blasting. I am growing it at the moment indoors in the dining room because outdoors the temperature is at night is a little bit too low for it it should not go below 13 degrees celsius at night so i brought mine in in a timely manner when i saw the spike starting to develop i let the spike grow out far enough there were no buds on it by the time i had to bring it in after that it has been facing the same direction all the time and if I have to open the terrace door for some aeration and change the air inside my dining room. Throughout this winter, I have been trying to match indoor and outdoor temperatures so that I do not risk bud blast. The temperatures have somewhat been okay. I've managed. It's the drafts that could also create bud blast. And that is what I've been so nervous about. And you can see something didn't make it here and I cannot tell you what that wanted to be, but anyway, three buds are still hanging in there. I'm just moving her from the direction of growth where she is located at the moment to put her up onto this rack. I was nervous, so nervous because she has a lot of roots that are kind of going 
everywhere. Look at that. <laughs> now, as you can see with the sun rays behind, I have a sunny day outside, but I am not filming her outdoors, not taking her out, not bringing her back in. So I do ask your forgiveness for having a little bit of an unconventional kind of setup to film this, and I hope that the light is okay. These guys can get really, really big. You could actually grow them as a permanent house plant if you give them enough light, no direct sun, but they need a lot, a lot of light in order to get them to bloom. Direct sun, despite the fact that the leaves are really strong and fleshy looking, will burn them very, very quickly. And I have an example of a burn right here. I got her with that burn, but there's another one on one of the leaves somewhere. And that was my mistake thinking it'll be okay. Seeing as it was spring at the time, no, nothing. I would not risk direct sun on this one down here in Southern Spain. In the winter, she is very close to some blurple lights as, an, as a light source. And in the summer, she's right up against a hedge <laughs> with, well, I'll put a picture in. in, in order to keep her in shade, but a very bright light because now that she's gotten as big as she is, I don't have space for her on any of the shelves outside that would guarantee constant shade because I have a lot of wind that blows a curtain back and forth. It's hot, dry wind. And if I'm not paying attention, that curtain could get caught and, you know, and expose direct sun. So my little setup with that umbrella and right by the hedge is a little microclimate I've created for the big angrecoids, the two big ones that I have. That is for me perfect because I can water down the hedge in the background and all the roots that you see here <laughs> grew last summer, all of these long ones that you see, they grew last summer and straight into the direction of the hedge. So for at least six months, I did not move this orchid. And I was also very happy to see that the roots during my hot and dry summer were surviving and growing. But now that it's indoors in winter, the strangest thing is they're not growing anymore. And I have more humidity now in winter than I do in the summer outdoors. So my little hedge microclimate, in order to keep that humidity to the max, is working really, really well. I am getting more roots, as you can see, in the stem. I will not be turning this orchid around. There's too much going on. She is too all over the place with the roots, with the spike. But I have quite a good root action starting again. And some of the roots, the older roots, are actually branching. So. All good, all good. If I sound a little bit breathy in my voice, yes, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> I just love this orchid so much. I'm so thrilled that she is in bud. And I just, uh, I've been ignoring her all up to this point. Ignoring in a sense that don't look at the buds, don't stare at them because, you know, they might just blast on you and, and woohoo, disappointment. But yes, I'm, I'm blown away that I've gotten an orchid that I believe is two years ahead of schedule to bloom already. And I am super excited to see her bloom. And you can see in my case here, I have her in an orchid top pot. This is a large one. She came in a small, typical nursery container, those sleeves. It's packed full in sphagnum moss and all the roots had circled and circled and made a really tight knot in that pot which was quite difficult to remove all the sphagnum out of and get in between the roots that are just strong and tough and they're like sticks. But I wasn't as careful as everybody said. If I'm going to wait five years for an orchid to bloom, as I repotted her, I was going to just get her as clean as possible so that I didn't have to worry about the pot health and the climate inside the pot. I did crack a few roots, but still, three years after receiving her, she is in bloom. And as the books say, normally they go dormant if there's any root damage to them. So that's why I'm so careful with these long roots as well. Because, you know, in the back of your mind, you always have that. And Grecoids don't like their roots disturbed. So yeah, very, very careful. 
how I maneuver this orchid at this point in time while she is indoors. The moment my temperatures are steady above 13 degrees Celsius, I am going to have that orchid outside back in that area and let the angle of the sun then rise high enough before I put the umbrella up indoors. And speaking about this pot, it is an orchid top. It has a lot of aeration around. You can see how the roots are just growing through the slots of the orchid top there, coming in and through. And I have water roots in the pot. So they have come and grown through and they're now in the saucer circling themselves around. When I clean this orchid top pot, just the saucer, I go in with my jet sprayer on high, on a really thin nozzle, put the pressure up high and I pressure kind of spray any kind of debris that is in the saucer. So that just to keep it a little bit clean. But you can also see that there's a little microclimate going on in this pot. On the surface, I've got ferns and all these other funky little things growing and moss, which came naturally. I did not do anything about that. I also have a resident spider. So this little ecosystem there is something that I am very, very protective of. I will not let this fern get out of hand. I keep plucking the leaves. I keep maintaining it small. I don't want the issues of the fern roots competing with my angricoid roots. You can see how the leka is extremely bumpy on the surface. And that is because the roots in there are going mad. When I potted her up into this pot, my leka was down here. On the bottom, I have lava rock. And then I have that interspersed with leka and a bit of ceramis right at the center because the roots came in that sleeve with sphagnum moss and we're very, very used to a high, high water retentive media. So from the middle out, as it's like a ring, ceramis is in the middle and then I filled leka around it. And literally in the last three years, that leka has risen bit by bit. The first time this summer, this past summer of 20, I actually found some leka beads distributed along the floor as the orchid is pushing itself out of that pot. I have no intention at this point of repotting her. I don't need to repot her. She has a source of water, permanent source of water. There's always water in the saucer here. I never let that go dry. The only difference being, is it going to be fertilized or is it just RO water? Well, in this case now, she is on full fertilizer regime and I go 300 parts per million and that is every time the saucer is almost empty. I don't want evaporation to be a problem and make that so concentrated. So I do top up every once in a while this saucer with a little bit of plain RO water just to make sure that concentration of the saucer with the salts isn't too high. It is very difficult to see on camera, but there is some salt accumulation on the prongs here on the side. Let me see if I can zoom in. What you see as white markings here, 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 these markings are like bubbles in the structure of the orchid top. But down here, I hope that is caught on camera, you can see mineral deposits which sometimes I will remove with a little bit of toothbrush. And normally I do that when she comes out the first time in the summer with a toothbrush and jet spray as I work to flush away those salts and not have them end up in the tray and become a problem to the roots. I've had some roots stop growing like here, but it hasn't touched salt, not in this case, but in the back on the round the other side, I have a root that did touch the salt and it burnt the tip. So that is unfortunate. Just happens that when it comes to winter, I have to be a little bit more cautious with how I go about watering this one. I do not want to encourage any kind of stem rot. They can be very prone to that. Once she's outside and if she gets rained on for three days consecutively, which has happened, it's not often, but it has happened. But once she's outside and has this continuous rain, there's also a massive, massive airflow so that, that I don't worry about stem rot when she's outside. 
it's the problem when she's indoors and if I were to get too much water here around the stem, that's when I would have a little bit of a worry regarding stem rot. As sturdy as these orchids look, they have their finicky and delicate side. The leaves being prone to sunburn, stem rot being a problem if, it's, if there's not enough aeration. I don't have fans in my dining room, so I don't have that constant flow and aeration. I do open my terrace door for two or three hours a day, but that'll also only depend on how strong the wind is and temperatures outdoors and indoors have to match. And the only reason I'm really fussy about those hours of opening the terrace door or the strength of the wind is because she is in bud. Normally, I wouldn't worry so much, but if there's something in bud that is indoors and suddenly you open the door and you left, let a draft in, it can happen even at this stage that they can blast. And I don't want that to happen. <laughs> Not really. Having said that, with this care collab, I'm gonna get myself some bloom fix on the Angraycourt Prestwood, and I'm so looking forward to seeing the videos from Todd's Tropicals, from TD More and Nurse Orchids, and Sue Lee Charon. Now, not everybody's might be in bloom, but I'm sure that some will be, that they have to be. But that is the beauty of these Care Collab videos here. I think it's marvelous to see on the same day, all these, the same orchid doing different things in different countries, climates, environments, and setups. So I do hope that you are going to go and check out the links in the description to see how everybody else's Crestwood is doing. Now let me go back to my temperatures. As I mentioned, at night, if the temperatures start to go below 13 degrees Celsius, this orchid comes inside and for the first time, she has stayed inside all winter. I have mild winters here in Spain, and I can have my orchids outdoors even through the months of January and February at night, because sometimes my temperatures are not lower than 13 degrees Celsius. In this case, again, I'm not risking it. She's gonna stay indoors. Normally, I do move her in and out so that she gets all the aeration. She can get some of that rain. In the summer, she can go as hot as she can go. They do need a very, very high humidity though. And that is why I did my little microclimate corner there with the umbrella. But heat is not a problem. Direct sun, yes. When I have this very, very dry, hot air during the days, I am so rigorous. I exaggerate pretty much with my sprayer. In the mornings, I spray a lot with my fertilized sprayer. I literally, I don't care about nodes, leaf joints, stem, nothing whatsoever. That's the, my morning spray, 300 parts per million, full on, full on drench soak. I can't get the roots to hydrate anymore. These aerial roots won't go green, but I saturate her all over with fertilized water of 300 parts per million. Then throughout the course of the day, the subsequent sprayings that I do, because now I have time, they are just plain RO water. That gives me the opportunity to go full on in the mornings for her to absorb the nutrients. And then I flush her by spraying her several times a day to get the salts off of her. But that is a secondary effect. The reason I spray her so much is because of my dry air. It's a good thing because she gets everything she needs during the morning and everything then gets flushed away by the evening. And then if we do have sporadic amounts of rain, this orchid top is just genius because everything just pours straight through the pot and will pour over and spill over the, the saucer. So I'm not worried about water logging or anything like that. She is a heavy, heavy drinker, that is for sure. There's nothing shy about this orchid, not her size, not her growth habit, and definitely, definitely not her need for water. I have a free draining mix, but it's high, high, highly retentive. And from what I saw when I saw these orchids in the wild, well, in gardens in Kenya, is that many of their gardeners would actually plant this orchid in the nursery pot as is, not remove anything, into the ground, which is, was very, very high in sand. Granted, we are living by the coast, but the whole pot just went into the ground and was then strapped to a tree and it was left to get on with it. 
and eventually it would be, be like a meter tall and then have all these little keikis and uh, subsequent plants around the base and become quite the magnificent specimen. This can be grown indoors, very bright area, but make sure you've got space for it because it is a large orchid. And I do have, and again, I'm not going to move her, forgive me for that, but I do have a little basil keiki growing on it already down here. I think you can see that, maybe, maybe, maybe. Let me zoom in. Oh gosh, this video is getting long. I'm sorry, I just can't stop geeking out over these. They're gorgeous, I love them. There, here's a basil keiki. So my little one is not so little. Maybe there was a miscalculation in how many years to bloom from the nursery. I'm so happy that it worked out this way. And we will be seeing these blooms for sure once they open in another video. In the meantime, I sincerely hope that you enjoyed this video. It was a long one staring at an orchid that is not in bloom. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm being very protective about this orchid at the moment. And I'm really thankful if you've made it this far, listening to me geek out over this. <laughs> one of my favorites. I want to thank once again, Todd's Tropicals, TD More Than Just Orchids and Suli Charon for this care collab, for joining in. It is so, so appreciated. Again, I look forward to your videos and everybody else that's been watching, you've made it to the end. Thank you so very, very much. I really, really appreciate it. Have yourself a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.